Hey guys, today I want to talk about some of the basic concepts in ecology. So first off, what is ecology? Ecology is the study of the relationships between organisms. And here's what that means. Well, I'll give you this with, with some examples. So ecology would study something like how sharks and humans affect one another. One example might be humans might look at how shark attacks occur in certain parts of the world. Ecologists, people who study ecology, might also look at how human overfishing of the oceans is affecting shark populations. Another good example is something like what happens when you put too many chemicals into a river? How does it affect the fish in there? How does it affect other organisms? A good real world example of this would be something like putting too much phosphorus into a river. If you put a bunch of phosphorus into a river, it causes a bunch of, it causes a bunch of algae, which are small plant-like organisms, to grow out of proportion. And it typically kill everything else in the river because there's so much chemicals in there. Um, another one might be, what impact might there be on dolphins hunting in an area on fisheries? So the good example of that might be, if dolphins are competing, you know, they're eating the same fish that fishermen might eat, how might that be affecting the fishermen in the area? That's basically what ecology does. Ecology looks at how organisms affect one another. So the first thing you have to kind of understand with ecology is this term we call the biosphere. The biosphere is the part of the earth that supports life. So basically here's a good analogy to kind of get that idea across. If the earth was an apple, the biosphere would be the skin of the apple. Another way to think about it is, is that any part of the earth that supports life is part of the biosphere. One good counterexample of what's not a biosphere would be like Mars. There's no life on Mars, so Mars doesn't really have a biosphere as a result. So it's only the part that supports life. Okay, now when you're looking at ecology, ecologists like to study certain parts of the environment. The first part of the environment ecologists are going to look at are what we call the biotic factors. Biotic factors are basically the living things in the environment. So it's the humans, it's the cats, it's the bacteria, it's the grass, it's the trees. Anything that is alive is considered a biotic factor. Here's some other examples. You have insects are biotic factors. Humans, you, you're a biotic factor. Cats, like all the cats in Riyadh, those are biotic factors. Dogs are biotic factors, and that, etc., etc. Okay, the other thing ecologists have to look at are what we call abiotic factors. Abiotic factors are basically the non living things in the environment. So these are things like water, things like sunlight, temperature, how much carbon dioxide is in the air. All these things are going to affect the environment. Some other examples, as I already mentioned, oxygen, temperature, carbon dioxide. These are all good examples of how of abiotic factors and what you can look at. Make sure you can think of some of your own abiotic factors too because Abiotic factors have almost just as much of an impact on the environment as do the biotic factors. So, the levels of organization. This has been a concept I know a lot of students in class have had a real difficult time with, and I think that's because this is one of those ideas that's best shown with a graph. So, what I have here, I have a little mouse pointer, and these are the various levels of organization. So first off, there's the individual. The individual is easy. It's basically one organism, and that could be one human, one antelope, which is what this animal right here is. It can be one bird, it can be one plant, it can be one of anything. It's the individual. Then there's the population. The population is a group of organisms of the same species in an area. So let me give an example of what that would be. So with these example, I believe they're elk or caribou, one of those two types of animals. They're all of the same species. As a result, they make up a population. 
Um, another good example of population would be like the humans in Riyadh. We're all the same species. And as a result, we're all essentially, he goes, we're all essentially a population. The next level we call a biological we call a biological community. Here it's marked as a community. It's the exact same thing. A biological community and community when you're talking about levels of organization are essentially the same thing. So don't see that and be confused. A community is basically all the organisms in the area that live in that particular area. So it's in this case you have the owls, you have the bobcats, you have the rabbits, you have the tree, you have what's probably a beaver. Can't tell, the picture's kind of crappy. Um, he goes, you have a moose right here. You have all the various trees. This makes up the biological community. It's all the organisms in an area. Now, the next level is a little more complicated. The next level is called the ecosystem. The ecosystem is basically the biological community plus the abiotic factors. So things like the water, the temperature, the mountain ranges in the area, the carbon dioxide in the air. The ecosystem is essentially all of those things added to it. Now, there's one point of confusion here. I'm not going to test you on it, but I at least want you to understand that it's there. If you look at this picture, it shows community and ecosystem. The ecosystem seems to have more animals. That's true. The ecosystem tends to look at the whole area. The problem with this whole idea of levels of organization is, is that we're not going to go into enough, enough detail to really explain how to consider one thing part of the ecosystem versus part of the community and how big you want to make it or how small you want to make it. So for the purpose of this class, don't worry about that. Just know that the ecosystem is basically the biological community with the abiotic factors, the non-living things included. Now, the next level up from ecosystem comes biome. Biome is a good picture you can see right here, in which they essentially have the northern part of the United States as one biome. This right here is almost looks exactly to what they have right here. So it's the whole area. Every place that has this type of ecosystem is considered this type of biome. I think this would be, by the look of it, grassland biome. So a biome is basically just ecosystems that share a certain quality, that all share something in common. So they all like, there's the desert ecosystem, there's ocean ecosystems, there's coral reef ecosystems, there are even underwater ecosystems that are at the very bottom of the ocean that are run off of a totally different system. A biome is just basically looking at an eco a collection of ecosystems that share a similar quality. And the last level is a word we've already talked about. That's biosphere. Biosphere, as I've already stated, is every place on Earth that can support life. So the best way to think about this is think of it as almost like a pyramid, where the tip of the pyramid is right here. And as you go up, you see more and more information, more and more details, until you get to the very top of the pyramid, which is a giant part that has everything included. So ecosystem interactions. This is a fancy way of saying two words, habitat and niche. Habitat is where an organism lives. This is pretty simple. Mr. Russell's habitat is his villa. Um, your habitat is your house. The habitat of the cats in Riyadh is basically Riyadh. Um, this just asks where an organism lives. The second word you want to consider is the word niche. Niche is an interesting word. It's a combination of three things. The first is that it's basically the role of an organism in the environment. So it's like, what does this organism do? And there's three parts to this. First off, it asks, how does an organism find food? That's one good question. How does it get food? That's part of its niche. So for Mr. Russell, that would be like going to Burger King. For the cats of Riyadh, that would be rummaging through the trash of all the people in the area. The second thing is, how does it find a habitat? 
where does it know how to find where to live? This is one of those things, to us it seems common sense because we've always had a house, but for many animals, finding a house is really important. Um, I know there's birds in my hometown that like to find habitats by basically stealing the houses of other birds. That's what they do. Is it wrong? Well, kind of. You know, it sucks for the bird, but that's what it does. That's how it finds its habitat. The third thing that includes a niche is how does it find a mate? So how does this animal attract a mate? Um, I'm going to post a video later for you guys that will show this thing. It's basically called a dancing peacock spider. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet or not. Some of my classes have. It's basically a spider that dances around and it uses this dance to attract a mate. That is that spider's niche. It's how it attracts a female, basically. Every single species has something like this because if you don't, you know, if you don't make babies, you're not a very successful organism. Okay. Um, so yeah, I gave the example, apologize, didn't hit that beforehand. So obviously, dancing peacock spider, here's a good way of looking at it. You have the fact it eats small insects, so that's how it finds its food. It'll hunt them down. Um, how to find a mate? Not simple. It dances in order to do that. Um, how to find its habitat? Well, the habitat, it leaves, lives in Queensland, Australia. I tried to find some research for be a little more specific than this, but unfortunately, guys, I couldn't find anything. So all I know is it lives in Queensland. Maybe if one of you guys wants to be awesome and you decide to go study in Australia, you could find out how this thing finds its habitat because it would be actually really cool because it's not anywhere on the internet. Curse you, internet. Okay, next part. Community interactions. Community interactions is a fancy way of saying how do organisms affect one another? What do they do? So the first part is we look at competition. This is not one of your key terms, but it is still a very important idea. Competition is when two organisms eat the same food, basically. So um, a good example of competition in the area would be um, ants. Ants and humans eat the same types of foods. So oftentimes when we find ants in our houses, we usually kill them. We don't leave them alone. We usually wipe them all out because we don't like them going through our pantries. We don't like them eating things that's ours. Ants are in competition with humans. Another good example would be the cats of Riyadh. The cats of Riyadh, if they had it their way, would have access to food before humans did. But because humans are bigger, they don't really compete with us very well. But if they could, they would. Okay, one of the next levels of, of community interactions is what we call predation. This is really simple. This is basically when one organism eats another. A good example of this is like a lion and a gazelle. The lion's going to eat the gazelle. Um, another example would be human and rice. Rice was alive at one point in time. You're consuming it. It probably doesn't want that, does it? Gazelle and grass. Another good example. These are all examples of predation. Now, one thing I disagree with your book on is the book doesn't actually use the human and rice and gazelle and grass example. And this is something that was debated in my biology courses, is, is that are humans and rice and gazelle and grass, would that be considered predation? And the answer is yes, is because one organism, a human or a gazelle, is eating another, rice and grass. Rice and grass are both still alive. They're just not animals. They are plants. They're in a different area, but they're still alive. They still meet the criteria of organisms. Um, obviously cats and mice. Forgot about that one, guys. Sorry. Okay. Another part of community act, community interactions is what we call symbiosis. Symbiosis it sounds like a really fancy term, but really all it means is that two species live together in some way. Um, symbiosis comes in three different varieties, three different ways of being um, a symbiont, which is basically the singular way of saying symbiosis. Um, the first one is what we call mutualism. Mutualism is a type of symbiosis, as I just stated, and this is when two species benefit from one another. And what that means is that both animals or both plant and animal in some way are getting something they want. Um, the best example I can think of that's the easiest to understand is bees and flowers. The bee gets pollen from the flowers that it can turn into honey. The pollen, the flower, gets basically a chaperone. The bee 
lands from flower to flower collecting pollen and because pollen's you know sticky and grainy and it falls off easily the bee is going to deposit pollen at every single flower so the bee is effectively acting as the mating guy you know he's the guy who's helping the flower find other flowers to have babies with um, another great example would be apples to apple trees and deer. One thing I said beforehand, if I give this example in class for the ninth graders, I don't think I gave it to the 10th graders, is, is that apples like animals because the animal walks up, eats the apple, and then hopefully will eventually poop out the seeds of the apple after it's eaten it, and it'll be somewhere away from the tree. That way the seeds don't have to compete with the parent anymore because the parent hopefully the app the animal ate the apple walked away somewhere and pooped out the seeds at some point in time and that's really good for the apple um commensalism commensalism is when one organism benefits and the other one doesn't really care um a good the best example i can think of that you guys will know is the cats of riyadh and humans Humans don't really care about the cats that run around Riyadh, but the cats benefit in some way because we're here. The cats rummage through people's trash, and they eat a lot of the trash. That saves Riyadh money, but at the same time, he goes, the cats are surviving off the trash of humans. But humans aren't really being helped by this relationship. We just, they're there. We see them. Cats are cute. Everyone likes cats. At least the internet likes cats. So to us, we see that, and to, it's, we don't really care. It's like, oh, okay, it's a cat. Don't worry about it. The cat, though, the cat needs us. Without us, the cat wouldn't survive. That's a type of commensalism. Oh, another good one this year. If you remember Finding Nemo, clownfish, which is what um, Nemo essentially was, and sea anemones. Sea anemones are little poisonous... They're, they're, they're animals, but they're really kind of weird animals. There's little poisonous little tentacle things that are inside the water, and they have little stingers. The clownfish is immune to their, is immune to their sting, doesn't get stung by them, but other animals do. So the clownfish will hang out on the sea anemone in order to protect itself from other predators in the area. But the sea anemone doesn't really care. The anemone doesn't benefit from the clownfish, it's just kind of there, so it doesn't really care. The last type of relationship is what we call parasitism. Parasitism is when one species benefits and the other one is harmed. I'll give you a couple of examples, but this one makes, I think this one makes pretty good sense. The first one is tapeworms in humans. A tapeworm is going to latch itself into a human small intestine and steal food as it comes on down through the stomach. Um, this is good for the tapeworm, but it's bad for the human because the human is losing its food. It's not getting its full food source. So if you eat like a thousand calories of food and the tapeworm steals half of that, you're really not getting a thousand calories. You're actually getting 500 calories, which for humans, we don't really care because we usually eat a lot unless you're from you know some of the poorer parts of the world but for the tapeworm it's essential you have to be there to survive um, another great example and this one kills millions of people every single year is malaria and humans malaria is a parasite it's a small little organism we call a protozoan and the malaria parasite needs humans in order to survive and humans are hurt in the process malaria is a deadly disease it can kill you so, in general, it's a bad thing. And that's basically all the information from this chapter you want to worry about, guys. Um, if you want to take notes on this video, feel free. If you have questions, f please feel free to post them in the comments below or come find me on Edmodo or in class. I'm really hoping this helps some of you guys who are a little bit weaker in your reading abilities. Thank you very much.